So can I take that whiteboard and erase it, or can I use it? No, we can erase it. When I get done right at the end, we'll yeah, I got that wet rag over there. Yeah. And the marker's right on top of it? Uh-huh. I got, no, I got the marker right here. We're rolling. I'm ready. I'm going to log myself in. Oh, you're going to log yourself in. All right. Well, hey, guys. It's that time again. It's That's Good Fish Live Monday night down at Bud's Bait. Uh, tonight we have a really special guest, the legend, John Bennett's here. Um, he's going to talk to us about you know how he got started fishing, and then he's going to talk to us and get real in-depth with square bill cranking. Um, before we get started, just a couple things. Number one, if you have a question, just make sure you put it on there. Uh, Peyton's got the camera tonight, so he's gonna ask your questions to us. Um, the second thing, when you're done with this, before you put your phone up and go to bed, sign out of Facebook, head over to YouTube, that's good fish, and just hit the subscribe button. We're putting out a ton of videos this year. We've got a lot, new, a lot more new stuff coming out, but we really have to get our subscribers up if we wanna take the next step and get you guys more information and more videos. So head over to YouTube as soon as you're done. It takes two minutes. Subscribe. And then one more time after that, head to Instagram. Shoot us a, a follow because um, we do post everything to Instagram as well. So um, just a reminder, you guys can come down here on Monday nights. Uh, we've got chairs set up. We've got a few people here. <laughs> Old Jeff Rose is here tonight. Um, so come on down. That way, if you have a question that happens after the live show's over, we're still here you can talk to us or if there's something you heard or something you need to pick up the store is open for an extra 30 minutes so without further ado we're going to bring john bennett in and uh john i'm gonna hand it over to you how did you get started in bass fishing well you know with the square bill and the shallow fishing i was lucky enough uh, to be blessed uh, to grow up on the osage river uh, before it was flooded to make truman lake so I fished shallow when I was a kid anyway, and then the lake got flooded, and, and uh, after my dad had taken me to all these little places around the river, uh, I got lucky enough to join the bass club, and uh, a good friend of mine, his dad named Jim Rush, and then his, he, his name was Rick Rush, they took me in a bass boat, and I was pretty much hooked. And I was lucky enough to grow up on Truman Lake, where pretty much from March to October, you can compete on that lake, or you have been able to, uh, by fishing shallow. Uh, I think it's the, you know, right in the area, it's premier shallow water lake now. And lately in the last few years, there's been more deep water fish and in the summer it becomes more difficult to maybe compete shallow, but you fish shallow. So that is conducive to being able to use a square bill. Uh, when the lake was young, lakes age. So when Stockton was very young in the 1970s, a uh, lot of timber, it's green timber. The square bill is not really that big of a factor because the the uh, limbs are small, green, and the square bill doesn't come through it that good. And then as you as the lake ages, say five to six, eight years, all you get left is the big limbs and the big laydowns and the stumps. That's when the square bill starts uh, really excelling. And so therefore, the square bill comes into play at that time. So in the late 80s, the square bill at Truman probably became came into play more than it had. Early on, fear for you, spinnerbait, worm, and a jitter. Uh, the square bill comes into play, and I just happened to be growing up then, and uh, Daryl Reach, who's my uh, fishing partner for years, uh, we kind of like to fish the same way. We like to cover water and shallow water, and the square bill became a tactic to add to the arsenal to pick off some extra fish, uh, and so that's how I learned to, to really do that, and I was just blessed to grow up in a lake where 
that was really a big part of it. And you could can compete uh, shallow like that. And a lot of other lakes now like this, they've aged, Stockton's aged, and there's not as much uh, cover there. The square bill excels on hard targets, I think. Sure. Rock, uh, stumps, laydowns, and, and even docks. Uh, but Truman and even Stockton early on had a lot of timber, but as it dies off, the targets get less and less, and they're, the square bill is target oriented. So in other words, targets are very important, and, but as the targets get diminished, then the square bill does come into play, but it's harder for you just to put that on and fish it all day long. Right. But when you see specific targets, it can come into play to pick off an extra fish or two, and so it becomes important, and I was lucky enough to grow up in an area where that was an important part of our arsenal when we started fishing. Now, you've been tournament fishing for how many years? I don't know. Uh, put about 1981, 1980, so. Not good at math, but. I took a few years hiatus where I didn't fish quite as much because I was teaching him how to play basketball. That was stupid. You should have fished. Uh, should have fished. But then back in, uh, you know, I fished maybe once a month or so there while, we, while I was coaching him playing basketball, but then uh, after he, you know, got into high school and you can't really fix them then. Right. Uh, <laughs> you kind of have to. You can't. You say, okay, well, I'm going to go back to fishing. <laughs> so then Daryl and I started fishing a lot more seriously again then. Now, if you guys remember last year, and, and John said Daryl Reach, Daryl was on our show last year talking about spinnerbaits. So we had one of the best spinnerbait fishermen in, in the United the States of Missouri, you know, talking about spinnerbaits. And then tonight, again, we, we, we get lucky with John because he's probably one of the best crankbait fishermen. Um, so you talked about where you grew up, Truman, that's where you like to fish. What kind of square bills do you throw? I mean, do you throw plastic? Okay. Do you throw First, wood? How about a shout out to Rick Klein? There's yeah. hope for guys like me. That's true. 72 year old. Hey, maybe we can still catch fish. I don't know. But anyway, that was kind of cool yesterday, right? For you guys that don't know, Rick won the Bassmaster Elite Series yesterday on the St. John's River. Um, it's actually his second win there. Yeah, he back won there at, in, the, in, at that place. In, yeah. yeah, the last time they were there, he won as well. So I think he's either 72 or just turned 72. So for you people out there that hurt a little bit, you know, if he can do it, we can all do it. So, um, so anyway. What kind of square bills do you throw? Because you know, there's so many people out there making them. There's so many different kinds. So can you kind of tell us what yeah, types I'll put and which ones you throw? I'll put them into a few different categories. But first, uh, what we're going to do is we've got a $10 gift certificate to Buds and a $10 gift certificate that, to Bass Pro to the first person that responds online. When, when somebody comes up to you and they say, hey, I've got this great square bill, and the first thing somebody does is say, well, how does it blank? Fill in the blank. The first, the, person to, the first person to the first person answer that, Peyton can run them down and tell us. Uh, in the meantime, I'll talk about square bills. I think there's there's really two types: balsa and plastic. Uh, I like balsa around wood. Uh, plastic will get it done, but I like balsa because it's a little more buoyant, so you can bowstring it off when you get it hung up, uh, which is a technique where you we, pull your line. We have a winner. Okay, you have a winner. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the answer <laughs> is the answer is somebody always says, "How does that crankbait wobble?" wobble. Okay, that's the thing. Well, okay. here's the thing. There's wobble is different, and uh, when you see a crankbait, and here's an old B3. There's two kinds of wobble. There's one in the uh, x-axis, and that's the way the most of the old ones do it. If you look at the old, uh, here's an old balsa B2 with a brass tie, okay? And a lot of times the big O's when they were originally out, they came and they wobble, but they wobble in the Y axis or the X axis. And they come in, they'll shake your rod really good. But here's the thing, there's another wobble and that's in the X axis, okay? And I call that kind of a tumble. And uh, so if I, the reason that's important is I'm gonna use an example here is, is a mirror and uh, in a flashlight, and if, if a bass is feeding, he's almost always feeding up, okay? If, if I shine a light on this flashlight and it's above where you're at, and above where the fish is at, and that wobbles back and forth, he doesn't see the flash. He doesn't see the flash. If it wobbles down like this, he, he sees the flash. It. Off, on, off, on, off, on, okay? That is a frequency. Like, we think of sound and frequencies. Oh, different vibration level, you know. Uh, Daryl likes to talk about the different blades for the different vibrations right. right well this is a frequency lights in frequency and so what you want it, what i like is i like a crankbait that tumbles as well and it 
When it comes in the water, it wants to do some of that, not this, okay? So how does that happen? Well, the crankbaits that I like are uh, in, the, in the balsa series and even in the, the plastic, is it, these KBDs work pretty good. You can buy those here at Buds, yeah, by the way. Yeah, they got them here at Buds. The KBDs really tumble pretty well, too. Uh, but you'll see a couple of things. I like the tie, the line tie down on the bill. Now, uh, I like the old Balsa B2s. This is an old Balsa B2. It's been repainted. And this is what is known as an Ed Chambers 2. I've used it a little bit. How much are these going for these days? Well, at last I saw, they were somewhere over $50, depending on the color. There was one that Austin showed me last night for $175. Ed Chambers passed away, no longer makes the baits, so they've become really a, a, a hard thing to acquire, and uh, so the price has gone up on them. Now, they're really a good bait. Right out of the box, they, they tumble really good. They, they wobble. And the way I always test that is if you – I got a pond, and – you throw it in the pond, they'll come wobbling through. And if you got a good, good speed to it, and you stop it, a good one when it's when when you stop it, it'll turn 90 degrees. It'll just boom, just like that. And uh, Austin will ask me; he's giving me a whole you know plethora of baits to try, and uh, I'll always tell him whether they wobble really good or whether they don't. And uh, so the old balsa B twos in this, the thing about balsa B twos is. They are, they're, they're hard to get because every era was different and none of them are like even in the same era. So I can show you one. Uh, this is a very old one. And you can just tell between these two, these are the same era, tie down on the bill, but look at the butt of it, okay? One of them's fat, one of them's much thinner, okay? The, the, in my mind, the thinner the tail, the better on the old B2s. The reason that is, is uh, if you want the side to side, uh, the tumble wobble, then here's, here's what you need is you, you want that tie to be down there. And uh, if you think about it, if you pull it down like that, it's going to tend, the butt's going to tend to go up, okay? The smaller the butt, the less buoyant it is. It's going to be more level. Okay, so now when you get the tumble, it's more, a bass sees it from here rather than he's looking at it like this. He sees it side to side. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a shad hardly go through the water like that. <laughs> right? They usually go like this, right? So that's important. Now, the other thing they do, because it's not just where the line tie is, you could get the line tie. The old line ties were up, uh, you know, like I showed you on the nose with that one with the brass. And so it tended to, to go in the, uh, the X axis. Uh, but this, uh, if you'll notice, the real good balsas, when they start tumbling well, they have, they have lead, in the, lead in the hook hanger. Okay, so what, what does that do? From a physics standpoint, that, that keeps, that's going to keep this belly of the bait in a stationary mode while the top rocks. Okay, so that's how they get that rock a lot. Now, I don't know, I, I don't design the base, I'm just guessing from a physics standpoint, that's how they do it. But then now, now you get that tumble because that's being held, and now you're pulling it, and it's, it's going like that, and it's off on, off on, off on. I'm a fish underneath it. I see that you know, I see the frequency. It's a different light, light frequency. It's going black, yellow, black, yellow, or black chartreuse. Boom. I might get a couple more bites. And really, in today's fishing, as you know, let's say, uh, you know, let's say one with a tie like this, and you like it. Most people they'll catch me just as many fish. I I believe that. You know, these catch fish, these catch fish, whether the tie's there or, or, you know, whether you've got an old big O or whatever. But when you get done with the day anymore, you may get eight bites with one, but you might get another bite or two with a bait you believe in sure. or that maybe tumbles a little different, right? Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, you say, man, I had a great day. I, caught, I had eight bites. But somebody else might say, well, I had nine or ten bites. Now, they don't know because it's not apples to apples right there where you see it, but... I believe it gets you an extra bite or two, which may be the difference between getting a check or not getting a check. And uh, so you got to have confidence in it, and then I think that gives you every opportunity to do that because the bass, well, square bills are traditionally really shallow. Right. Now, is there, a, obviously, the, the WCs you can still get, but they're expensive, right? right. Is there something they make nowadays that you yeah. know, does that? Uh, that so I, I mentioned the plastic. Uh, these are KVDs, and then the KVD one and a halfs are really good too. The thing about the one and a halfs is uh, you can get some big hooks on them, and uh, for their size. Uh, so Austin, I've been experimenting a little bit. These black label balsas 
Okay, I think they're clip paste baits. Mm -hmm. uh, and Austin got some and we tried them and I will tell you that they're pretty good. Uh, when I stopped it, it almost turned more than 90 degrees. It, it really wobbled. I really like the wobble on it. Uh, this is a, a little B1 size. And uh, so it, uh, I, I haven't tried the B2 size, but I think, you know, it's really going to be a good bait. And I think they're what? You can buy them for 16, 18 yeah. bucks. I mean, they're, they're pretty but cheap for a bull. My guess bait. is if you really just threw the KVDs, you'd probably catch just, just about as many fish. Yeah. So the difference between... So I go back to these E2s, which are really good baits because they really wobbled side to side against the B3s. Now, the difference between these two, if you look at them, I don't know, Peyton's got the camera here. See the bill on that EC2? It's just a little bit longer. So now I replace the bills in these B2s when they break. I've got some extra bills. But the EC bait goes just a little deeper. So uh, you may not think that's matter. Oh, okay, well, it's only going three foot versus two and a half or three, three and a half or whatever. That makes a little bit of difference if the fish just don't want to come very far out of the cover. So that can make a, a big difference. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that... Uh, you can get there with this bait if you go down some line size. We'll talk about that in a minute when we talk about equipment. But with a 20-pound line, and mostly what I use, that longer bill actually gets you, you know, if you're fishing lay downs in three to four foot of water, that'll get you down there. This one probably is more than two to three foot. Right. So, so we got we got a question I think re relates to it. How, how shallow water are we talking here th that you mostly fish? I mean, when you're throwing a square bill, what are your what is yeah. your kind of go-to with these traditional square bills and i know they got some that'll go a little deeper you're not you're really not targeting anything deeper than five feet i don't think not hardly ever six now, feet's considered now, deep now you could be uh you could be fishing like post spawn those fish will move out into the if you got timber they'll move out into the timber in deeper water but they're not going to be very deep in the water column so they'll be down you know, three, four foot sitting in the tops of trees if you still got a bunch of limbs that you right. can see. Now, uh, you know, when the lake was, when lakes were younger, you had a lot more of that, but as they die off, you don't have as much timber out off the bank. But they will most move post spawn, might be four or five foot deep out in that stuff, right? But they won't, uh, they, they might be in 15 foot of water then, but for the most part, you're fishing five foot deep. And Daryl, by the way, Daryl's the one who guessed wobble, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I should guess that. All right. Uh, which black label is that? Uh, he said, is it plastic bill or a circuit board bill? Circuit board. This one's particularly circuit board. I think Austin brought another one that, uh, yeah, is a traditional plastic here. And you can see both those say the same thing. The line ties right down where the bill meets the whatever, and uh, they're, they're pretty solid baits. Uh, I can't say that I've fished them in a tournament yet, but we've been kind of looking for something that, you know, I just, I'm not going to pay whatever these are going for 50 so i'm just not gonna pay that for daryl those those crankbaits don't have a blade on them either <laughs> so um, yeah so you can put one on the back so the other the other difference between uh some of these baits you got to be careful with like the v2s the nice thing about the old v2s is the hook hangers and if you can just look at this the hook hangers are just a little bit further apart if you look i'll put it the same way so belly to belly and then look at the back okay it's a little well what does that mean that means that I can usually get two of the number two extra wide gaps on there, on a two. Now, you can't do that with the EC2s. They're gonna hook up. Right. Well, uh, in, in my mind, a bigger hook's always better, especially when you're fishing in shallow water. So uh, that is a little bit of an advantage for these. These go just a little deeper because they got that bigger hook. And, uh, but this will, this will hang a, a little longer number two on it. And this, uh, this one, usually you have to go a number four and a number two. Now, if I go, uh, if I go with the number four to number two, I always go with the longer shank hook on the back. Okay, why would that be? What do you think? Well, it hangs a little bit further behind the bait, so if they're biting short, yeah. you so still got a better A chance lot of times in shallow water, they're, you know, your strike zone off of something might be a foot and a half that they will actually come out. They're in that shelter, they're, they don't want to come out, They'll, they got bait coming by, might be a foot and a half, and so you cut. You throw, I mean, I know it sounds funny, but you throw that thing 20 inches away, and he says, "I'm not." I, I come out, and he gets reluctant, and he'll swipe at it. And that longer hook, believe it or not, if it's you know three millimeters sticking out further, might get you in the edge of their mouth, or get it a little deeper in the edge of their mouth, which means you've got a better chance of getting that fish in. All right. Um, so I don't know. Any other questions on uh, kind of the square bills, the different types? Any yeah. Um, what types of 
colors are you throwing mostly? I know it's pretty easy for you. Um, Did you look in the box? I, I don't know. Yeah, Peyton, oh, he made a video a while back of making fun of me because I like black and chartreuse. <laughs> uh, so most of mine tend to be black and chartreuse. But now, that's because most of my time is fishing them, say, from May to August, September, October, okay? And uh, they're relating to shad. But as you saw last year on Grand, Kevin Van Dam won Grand, and it was on a crawdad type on one Not of his own, one, right? Not but he <laughs> won his 25th career of victory. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, you know, it, I'm not saying these are the only colors, but the ones I throw up where you're in the shad is like shad, either uh, Tennessee shad, but this one's been repainted, so it's a little darker than your normal Tennessee shad. Uh, that's a nice old B2. But mainly in the dingier water, you're throwing chartreuse and black, uh, you know, a yeah. shad type, not the sexy shad and stuff like that. I'm gonna... not. Now, down at Grand, and, and last year, uh, a couple days before a tournament that Peyton and I fished, I got on a square bill bite down there. Uh, uh, you know, obviously it disappeared when the tournament showed up, but, <laughs> uh, but they were biting it. But yeah, down there with visibility, you know, two to three foot, then the color became a little more important. So yeah, then you get your sexy shads and colors like that that may become more important. The water I'm fishing usually, if if it's if there's visibility of 18 inches, that's too clear. Yeah, it's it, that's that's kind of borderline. You just don't see that much clear water up there. Uh, where I'm usually fishing, so. We're getting a lot of questions on equipment and stuff, which I think is kind of what we're gonna talk about next, yeah. so we might break a bunch of that down right here. Well, you had mentioned just a little bit ago about something about 20 pound lines, so along with line size, I mean, what rod size do you choose? Do you have a certain reel that you use or gear ratio? Just tell us a little bit about your equipment. Yeah, so I I get made fun of for this. I, I like a shorter rod for the most part. This is a six and a half footer. Uh, it real, the reel isn't as critical, except I do like the well, anymore they call it medium speed, six three, six four in that range. Um, I, I actually like the old round reels, uh, and I've got some because I, I like the old round reels. And the reason I do is because the radius on the handle is is much smaller, so you can vary your retrieve easier. Rather than if you think extended, the bigger your radius, the more it is harder to get revolutions on your reel. So I like the little ones, but uh, but you just can't hardly get them and keep them working anymore. So. Uh, I go with just standard reel, but I like this six and a half footer. If you're in the back of the boat, um, I'll go with a little longer rod because if, uh, if let's say, if Daryl or Peyton are fishing up front, then I need to reach out a little further. And uh, so a longer rod becomes important. But the most important thing, I think, with your square bill, when, especially if you are uh, fishing, is to learn to pitch your square bill. So you want, you know, a lot of people casting. And if you're going to use a longer rod especially, and i got it wrapped around the tip here, uh, but if you're going to use a seven-footer, you want to learn to just pitch that over there behind. I don't want to break up my good crane, but <laughs> you just want to get where you can just pitch it. I mean, your, your targets are going to be close. You don't, if you think about it, like there's one, two, three, four stumps there. I don't want to stand back here 50 foot and wing a cast over there and give him 40 foot of line to wrap it in another stump on the way home. So I want to get close where when I stick that fish, I can... I can really get him in the boat and get him away from whatever those other targets might be. Um, but when you're close, you don't need a longer rod. It's easier to work in the boat. I don't hook you with a cast when I'm, you know, uh, if a guy's standing right beside me, there's just all kinds of things with a shorter rod. Uh, and it's different, I get it, the longer rods have really taken over, and I think you were mentioning it was hard to find a six footer or six and a half that you really tried, like. Tried to find one, can't do it. Right, and. Uh, so if you want to sell one, let me know. Right, but uh, <laughs> I really like them like that. now. There's two schools of thought on the rod, and if you read some of the stuff on the, the master Rick Clun, you know, uh, he used, I think he, a few years ago I read, he used, he used a stiffer rod. Mm -hmm. uh, and I use a softer tip, but there's two schools on it, okay? So with the soft tip, what's the advantage of that is that once you hook a fish, you don't tear it out, okay? But what's the disadvantage? All right, look, soft rod, this is a pretty medium tip. Look, I, I can pull, I can bend that rod like that, clear like that, and look at that. Bend it, uh-oh, uh-oh, it ain't even stuck in my hand yet. Ouch! No. Mm. So, the point is, is while you think that medium rod's really nice, but you set the hook on a fish with these, there's six points of six points of pressure, plus he's got that huge balsa thing sitting in his mouth, you may not get a pressure point on there very good. It's not a single hook lure. 
So a little stiffer rod doesn't hurt as far as I'm concerned. Now, that, that'll hook them pretty good. Now that's what, that's, here's, here's how I buy a seven, I, I call them KVD two, two of KVD seven foot of 10 inch power launcher, medium. That, that would uh, come in the back of the, from fishing on the back of the boat. That would allow you to get the rudders to really drive yeah. that hook home good on them. Yeah, that'd, yeah. Be, that'd be long enough to pitch to where you, you'd have to pitch. Yeah. So yeah, that's and we got it. the other thing I would tell you is that short, a shorter rod, as you get old, is lighter. And I know that you just say that's not a factor, but carrying that rod all day long, pitching it, pitching it, pitching, shorter rod, a lot easier on me. At the end of the day, my shoulders don't hurt, um, and I'm using close targets anyway, so I, I really like the shorter rod. So. Real quick, you talked about gear ratio on your reel. Joe Reynolds, um, first off, he was the second person to say wobble, so I'm going to go ahead and give the gift cards to him instead of Daryl because uh, Daryl yeah. said he's going to give his gift cards away because he fishes with you. So yeah. I'm going to go ahead and give it to Joe Reynolds. So well, Joe Darryl, Reynolds, Daryl watches me fish a lot. Yeah, we'll, we'll hook up with you, Joe, and you'll get those two gift cards. He was asking why not a 5 one to one or a five three to one gear ratio. You said what did you say six three six four yeah. to one. Uh, so why not why yeah, not a five to one? Again, in the old round reels with there, I think they're the old ambassadors are five four or five six to one. Okay, and I, I should have brought one. They have a smaller diameter in the the from handle to handle. Okay, so if you think about it, that's easier to reel faster. So in actual line speed, you can pick up speed pretty fast with that. But the problem with the five fours in square bill fishing is you kind of want that to crack. We'll talk about that when we talk about cover next, but you kind of want it to move pretty good because deflection is a key and you want it to hit it hard enough that it'll deflect off of it. And if you go too slow, I'm not saying there's not times where slow doesn't matter, but if you go too slow, it doesn't get the reaction bite sometimes. So you want something, I don't want something screaming right. where it's just, you know, buzzing because you want to get it down to that de maximum depth, which sounds funny when it's three feet, but you want to get it down to the maximum depth and you want to keep it there, but you don't want to reel it too fast where it starts coming up in the water and you, you, you reduce the action. So uh, I do use some five forward, but, but a lot of times I will tell you for me, it's easier to slow down than it is speed up my retrieve. Sure. So if you think about that, it's easier to buy a little faster reel and try to slow down than it is to buy a slower reel and try to speed up. And it depends on, I think everybody is a little different, right? Some people it's easier to speed up or easy, you know, whatever, but for me, it's easier to slow down my retrieve than it is to try to speed it up and go, oh, I need to go like this all day long. Oh my gosh. But it's not hard to say, hey, I'm a little lazy today. I'll go a little slower. That's, for me, that, that works pretty good. So uh, the other thing is, is with, uh, again, line, I almost always use monofilament, 20 pound monofilament. Okay. I know uh, the fluorescent is, you know, Becoming a lot more prevalent. I even tried braid, but you mean braid, floor, fluorocarbon? Uh, yeah, fluorocarbon. Sorry, I messed up. Uh, but I even tried the braid. But the braid, does, if you get around wood, braid digs into wood, and your bait is constantly, if a square bill is always digging into the wood, you don't want that braid cutting into the wood and getting hung up all the time. Whereas the the mono kind of bounces off of it, floats it. And the other thing is with mono, okay, it stretches. Everybody says it stretches. Well, if I'm only making a 20-foot cast, there isn't much stretch there, right? So it doesn't really matter. The stretch is not as important. And as it's cheaper. It, yeah, well, and, and you can afford to. save saves money. You can, buy, yeah, you can buy a lot of mono, change out your reel every night. It doesn't cost you a buck to change it out, and you got fresh line on. Uh, now, I realize the uh, fluorocarbon doesn't... Uh, doesn't abrade quite as much, okay? So there, that's the advantage. Maybe you don't have to change it out as often. But uh, And if you want that bait to go a little deeper, like if you're down at Grand or something and you're fishing maybe where you want that square bill to go down four, four and a half feet, you got to get there with fluoro a lot of times. You're not going to get there with mono. Yeah, I know, I know my brother-in-law, he fishes with that. And unless if you're using um, some kind of copolymer or multi copolymer. Yeah. Do you use any copolymer or not? No, I don't know. No, no copolymer. Brent, Brent, I, I like one single name, not Co. Brent Spencer said this. This was pretty funny. All my rods, but one are six foot nine inches for the same reasons. Long rods are a marketing gimmick. I like that. <laughs> Long rods are a marketing it's pretty good. Gimmick. Um, Unless you flip. So that's kind of the equipment thing. Um, you know, it's it's pretty simple, really. Uh, you can you can probably use a little faster one, and depending on bait, you know what bait you're throwing. But I like the medium and. Uh, and you know you want to you'll, you'll find that speed. And some days they want it a little faster, and some days slower. But I think 
there's really a standard speed for the crankbaits. And I know we talked about types of crankbaits and we're talking about equipment right now. So, but we've had a lot of questions. So we probably need to get this nailed down here real quick. Uh, do you think that rattles, do you like rattles and crankbaits or silent ones? And is there a time for both? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I, um, if you fish long enough with a square bill, you will name your crankbaits. <laughs> okay, that's just the way it is. So I may have already said that. I don't know. But this, you haven't. Yeah, this one has a name for it. What's the name here? It's, well, I'm going to leave out the yeah, first you name. Yeah, you can't leave, it's, you say it's the first It's Blank part. Creek 5, okay? <laughs> Blank Creek 5. But uh, one day, late in the day, this old boy drug a five-and-a-half-pounder out of a laydown, and we ended up winning that tournament. And, and so it got its own name that day, and it stayed. That was probably seven, eight years ago. Just zoom in on how I, Well, I remember thing. fishing in the tournament been with this guy, and he, he usually it's like if we're having a really tough day and he really needs a bite, he's going to pull out that one. So, uh, back to your rattles versus, I think a lot of time a rattle is good, but I have this one, I mean, you know, I call it, it's known as old silent, because it's quiet when it comes through the water. But uh, if, if, if I'm up in real dirty water, I like, uh, <laughs> I like big balls, <laughs> all right? Uh, so when you feel the rattle in one, right, there's some that feel like, you know, a little beep, 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 beep. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I like a big ball. Let me there. hear, let me hear that. See, it's pretty low frequency, and as Peyton knows, my hearing's gone bad, so when the frequency goes up, I can't hear it anyway. But the low frequency, I can hear that crankbait, and, uh, and a low frequency thud, 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 I mean, uh, I, I like that in the dirtier water. So um, I think there's time for silent, and for the most part, I think the, uh, all the E2s are silent. Yeah. They're just straight balsa. Um, but a lot of the bag leaves have, like that one has a deep, little bit deeper rattle in it. Um, and it's funny with Bagley's, you just kind of, I mean, since most of them now, for 20 years ago, you have to kind of go test them out yourself to see what the rattle sounds like because there's no package with them or anything like that. And they're all different, thicker tail, thinner tail, uh, uh, different rattles in them too, so. Scott was asking what what brand of line, I'm pretty sure you use what, trialing big game most of the time, mono? Yeah, and... the big game, uh, big game or the, uh, just the Bass Pro Shop. Which so. they have the Trilene Big Game here at Bud's. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I know you don't get too complicated on the Well, lines. I believe in a name brand. Yeah. Uh, you know, I believe you get you, you get a name brand, but you can get name brand mono really pretty good. It's pretty good, good quality. The, the thing personally I like about mono is I know when it's going to break. Uh, I, I, went, I went to Floro years ago, and there was just times where I, I couldn't predict. I don't know, maybe my knot wasn't quite good enough, whatever. It just it broke for no reason, and I don't like that. I don't like it. Mono, I know, hey, it got overlogged, got beat up, it broke. I, I, I can't prevent that. But most of the time, it doesn't surprise you just all of a sudden breaking out of nowhere. Whereas Floro, once in a while, it's just like, I don't know. If it gets a little nick in it, it'll break. Or if you burn to the knot a little bit, it might break and surprise you. I don't, I don't like that surprise. That's just me. So we, we better really take a step back here because we don't want to offend any of those fluorocarbon fishermen out there because they are very passionate about fluorocarbon. Oh, I'm sure. I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I have no problem with it. Uh, it's really good sitting in the box, huh? isn't it? It's really it's good, good sitting, sitting in the box. box. Yeah, I, I got, I got fluorocarbon. I use fluorocarbon for some other things. I just think. Yeah, this. deeper crankbaits, but we're mainly talking about square bills and. Right. Yeah. So. Like I've got. 12 and 14 now that I use for deeper crankbaits and uh, and I've even flipped with uh, floral before but for this that's what I usually use um, I think there's pros and cons but I, I just think the floor or the uh, mono works better for me and everybody has to like I said you have to do what you feel confidence in that might pick you off a fish or two that you right. feel like will happen that day because all of this helps me pick off a fish and uh, or at least I think it does, and if that's that's what makes you happy, then that's what you got to stick with. Yeah. So, is there right. anything else you want to go into as far as equipment, or do you want to go ahead and move into what types of cover we're looking at here? Uh, yeah. Let's. let's you want to talk about cover a little bit? And, yeah, that's great. Okay. So, All right. we're gonna do. A, we're gonna do. A, you need a rag. Yeah, the rag is over there. Yeah. Right there. There's a wet one. So we're gonna go ahead and draw this thing up for you guys. Um, Brian O'Dell asked if you change your hooks out. Yeah, he does change them out for bigger yeah, hooks most of the time, right? As you can see, yeah. I keep a, I got a whole hook box over there. I use 
Okay. Gamakatsu. Now these are threes. If you have to buy the odd size to get the longer one rather than go to a four, I always buy the odd size. Oh, okay. got it, bud. Okay. All right. So we're gonna Bob Ross this presentation here about what types of cover we're doing here. So this is a this is a real treat here because we're gonna go in depth. Yeah. So one thing when you're square bill fishing, again, you you notoriously lose a lot of fish. Uh, so we're gonna draw us a lay down here. Here's a lay down, lay down, and you know the water levels over it. And when you cut, when you bring your boat up to it, my belief is with square bills. Um, it's tremendously important because you lose a lot of fish, like I showed you there with your hook set, you don't all get the hook buried in them, to be really precise in the, the few targets that you have. So the first cast, to me, is not in the kill area necessarily because if there's a fish sitting out here, all right, we'll draw the Christian fish, <laughs> all right? If there's a fish sitting out on the edge, you want to throw out there, if he comes out, he'll get it, you've got a high probability of getting him out. It's about probability. You've got a high probability of getting him out of the lay down. If you just throw in here first and one chomps it in here, first place, this guy's getting smart because he just saw his buddy get dragged out of there. And the second, he, this guy's got a chance to wrap it in every limb in there. Okay? So you want to pick out on the edges first with a square bill. And you're, you're, you increase greatly the probability you will land a fish if he hits. Then, as your boat gets closer where you can get an angle, you want to take the angle with the log. So you don't want to... In other words, you don't want to fish this lay down from this angle if you can help it, and you don't want to fish it from this angle if you can help it. You want to fish it with the grain. The bait will come down. You won't get it hung up as much. It'll maybe hop over a side limb or something, and then when you get him, if you think about it, you can haul him out of there, and he'll be parallel with the grain rather than try to haul him through three limbs. And that's just a game of probability of how to get you know a fish out of there. So one thing I'm hearing you say is, you're trying to hit the cover with your crankbait. Now, a lot yeah. of people are worried about getting hung up. Can you be an effective square bill fisherman when you're fishing that far away from the cover? I mean, do you have to bang the cover? Yeah, pretty, you don't have to bang. I mean, there'll be a few idiots that hit, you know, without banging it. But uh, if you want to catch most of the fish, you're going to have to be near the cover. Uh, so the other thing that you fit, lay downs, uh, and then the other wood cover is what? Stumps. Stumps, okay? Stumps. So if I draw you a stump here... You know, he's got, the big thing is, roots. is there's lots of roots, okay? And then, but a lot of people, when they throw, the thing is, what, what, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to throw past the stump, because it's going to take that crankbait, two or three cranks to get down to the depth. All right, well, a lot of people will throw their, let's say, if I, if I let's draw out the other axis, they'll throw their crankbait past it, and then they drag it right there. Okay, well, that sounds great in practice. The problem is, is as you throw in, here's your, your little crankbait, draw a treble hook isn't that terrible okay there's my little crankbait and, and okay as, so as you it dives down what happens the line goes down along the stump so if the line goes right down along the that stump which means the line is going into the bark which means there's a higher probability you're getting that stupid thing hung up and you don't want to get hung up because you don't have as you know you want to make that target as pay off as much as possible so what you want to do is you want to cast pass and then dive it down and then bring your rod over. So if, if that, there's a, a stump over there, I want to throw it past. And then I want, once I get it down, then I bring my rod over so my line comes over then. And then the bait bumps the stump. But my line is already down at its deepest point, so it doesn't have to scrape that log all the way down and get that bark. And there's a good chance. You know how it is if you've got a little sliver of bark, the line gets caught in it. And then your bait goes right up there and, and you're hung up. And so... The hung up part's not hard. I mean, you can get it, but if a fish wants to hit it, he's not going to hit it, and you've ruined that particular piece of cover. Right. So uh, the other thing is, is sometimes, the high probability of times, what you've got when you hook a, bait, a fish with a bait like this is what happens. He's got it, and that other hook is flopping, flopping around out there, and it comes in contact with a piece of wood, and it hangs that piece of wood, and he goes. So you want to... Try to keep your line out of the wood because that way if, if you hook him and let's say here's the stump and you hook him here and your line's hooked in the bark as you really mean it's going to come right up in there and then that hook even though he's hooked it'll hook in there hook in there and you'll lose that fish I mean, you won't get a boat over there fast enough or he'll tear out so it's really important to to keep your line out of that bark as much as you can but you want the bait to hit it okay that's the way you kind of think of it is two different things Line out, bait in, because that bait 
does need to hit it or bounce off. That really helps quite a bit. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the, the cover. If you're fishing, uh, you know, you're fishing docks. Uh, I won't tell you I'm an expert, at, you know, fishing square bills around the docks. I, I do it, but uh, again, if you've got things that you can bounce it off of, that's even better. But a lot of times with docks, those fish will sit out under their. You're trying to run it under the dock. Yeah, they'll sit under the floats and they'll they'll want to run out. So you kind of use the shade. So it's not, you know, maybe bumping it on anything if you don't, but they'll, they'll sit in that shade. And so the shade might be two feet away from the float, right? Because of the sun angle. So he might be sitting two foot away from it and you use the shade as the cover and you run right along that shade line. Uh, and that'll get you a few, few bites sometimes too when they get on that pattern. Uh, the current matters a lot on that too, I think, whether they're running water or not. So I don't know if we have this question, but do you throw balsa around docks? Mm -hmm. I seldom do that. <laughs> You can do it, but uh, real rock, rock and docks, I think, are conducive to throwing a lot of plastic. You, you know, you're not bowstringing it off because you're getting hung in wood a lot, and so there's just a lot of things that plastic does fine with it. Uh, and so I use mostly plastic around the docks, but you know, if, if you've got some wood and stuff and lay downs, you might want to, you want to throw a balsa in there too. I'm never against throwing balsa, but it probably won't be. One of those. Creek 5. Yeah. yeah. Creek 5. You got any other questions? No. The, a lot of people are saying they really enjoyed it. Good in-depth uh, good in-depth coverage here. So if you guys have any other questions, uh, we've got a few comments. I mean, Mike Walker said, he I broke off on my biggest fish of my life for no reason last summer on fluorocarbon. I'm sticking with Trilene Big Game. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, I think that, to me, oh, and don't get me wrong, most all the pros are throwing floral a lot now. I mean, I get it, and I know it's a great line. I'm just like that. It's like... It seems like it surprises me once in a while. I don't like surprises. If mono breaks, it's like I know it should have broke, and it broke. Uh, at least I can deal with that. But um, you, know, you got to retie, and you know, uh, it, it's not as abrasion resistant. Mono isn't, but I, I, I like it. And for short casts, I think the stretch is fine. We got one uh, question: like, what's your difference? Do you have a difference in color choice on a sunny day versus a cloudy day? <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't bring one. Uh, so well, here's my theory on that. I got a theory on everything, right? <laughs> he does. Okay, the theory on the X, Y axis. Okay. On cloudy days, I like I like a ghost color. White ghost right. shad bone. Yeah, bone. a lighter color in even in dirty water. Okay, but it'll be almost all ghost. Okay, it doesn't have the striations like. Like, a, like this would be black, yellow, or black chartreuse, black chartreuse. It would be all white. I forgot to bring that. I probably got one. Here, I'll show you. Tom said, don't, said, don't give up everything. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see. I don't know. Yeah, anyway, I don't, catch, I don't catch fish anymore, so it doesn't really matter. But anyway, so on a cloudy day, my theory is, is that the fish are up higher in the water column, so they're not attacking from below as much. They don't much. need shade. So, yeah, so they don't, since they're, they may be parallel to the bait in the water column, that that tumble on the y-axis, that flash is not as important on a cloudy day as it is on a sunny day. So on a cloudy day, they're up, they see it, and it comes by, and they see that wobble, and they feel it, boom, I'm getting on it. The color change is not as important. On a sunny day, that changeover, you know, the, whether it be uh, Tennessee shad color where you got the black to the foil or the black to the gray or the chartreuse to the black, that's important on a sunny day because they're underneath it and they're seeing it, but they move up a lot of times and they're up in a water column and you know you didn't think a foot or two would make a lot of difference but if like again if you're below that mirror you and it flashes you don't see that flash but if you're up even with it and it comes through like this and the and a lot of the old b3s will when you see them wobble they are moving a lot of water well if you're parallel with it that's great right i, I can right. attack that uh, so that's my theory on on cloudy days versus sunny days it's good uh, and a lot of people I know throw shards. I, I really don't like chartreuse on a, on a cloudy day. I just really don't. So. It goes back to it's just a confidence deal. Yeah. We've yeah. talked about that a lot on these live shows. It's, yeah. Find your confidence bait, confidence color, and throw it. And for you guys that don't throw them a lot, this is a great starting point. So, Jeff? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I might add one more thing on it. <laughs> just a, you know, a, this is a good, this little fat boy was a, a nice little crankbait, and it, was pretty cheap and it wobbled to beat the band. In fact, 
Daryl really likes throwing this bait, uh, and when he catches one, I'll say, well, it's probably been a pound bigger if you had paid a few more bucks for a crankbait. But, uh, <laughs> but this crankbait catches a lot of fish, those little fat boys, and so uh, you don't necessarily have to pay a ton of money for a crankbait if you're just fishing ponds. KVDs are a good price. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, you can, can buy the KVDs, and they'll, they'll probably catch as many fish as anything else. I, I think some of the times it, we get a little elitism is in, in us, and we like to say, oh, God, i got to have that perfect ball so I'm not sure that's necessary but I do think there are some subtle differences and if it gets you one more fish in a day in a tournament that means something uh, and if you feel like it gets you one more fish that means something so Jeff you're really enjoying this aren't you I really am well, you got any questions live <clears throat> on the spot on the spot what's, what's your take on winter fishing with crankbaits the col colder water or cold winter fishing water. cold water when, yeah, that's a good question. Like water temps, what what, what you what do you like water temp wise when throwing well, spring? Well, you were talking, you say uh, May to October. Right. Now I would, uh, it's not really a timeline for season for me. I fish year round, so I want to yeah. know if I'm going to go out there and it's cold water, is that still going to work? Yeah, I think you get below 52, 53 degrees. I don't think the square bills. I'm not saying there aren't days when it wouldn't, right. but. Uh, you know, it's an active bait. It's moving pretty fast. Now, if you had a sunny day where it was just 50, 51, you might catch a few fish. But I, I most everything I've caught, it's got to be above 52, 53 degrees, really. And that's kind of the point where we start saying, hey, that square bill is going to work. Uh, in the wintertime, I can't I can't really remember a time when I, you know, really. Maybe, well, I know. You know, but a lot of times maybe it's because you don't throw it because you don't think you're going to catch one. You know, I don't know. But I, I don't remember catching them. Well, and I've heard you say this a lot, you know, the – hotter the muggier the nasty hot sunny day sometimes that square bill can catch a few fish can't it? if you're sweating because it's so stinking hot and there's no wind you better have a square bill you heard somewhere. it here first yeah mm -hmm. i mean that's what you better have because there'll be a square bill bite if you know the wind starts blowing and you can you might catch them on it but then you start getting maybe a spinner bait and you know even you know some other moving baits but a little hot and muggy where you say, man, i got to have another mm. drink of water. Uh, <laughs> it's a good day. Probably ought to be chucking a square mm. bill if you're fishing shallow. Right. You know. Uh, what if you do that and you um, hauling them in all day? Yeah. For checking the bill is in what? Yeah. Well, if, if you do that all day, uh, you better have plenty to drink. <laughs> you haul, yeah, because it, it's going to wear you out. Throw yeah. them all day and, you, and you're hauling them in the boat all mm -hmm. day. Yeah. It, it's gonna, or, and you know, the thing when you fish on the lakes, there's no shade. That's true. <laughs> you know, you're, you're fishing without shade. If you're in the woods, you'd at least have some shade, but you don't have any shade. I got uh, Joe Reynolds was asking about S cranks. I, yeah. I don't know much about the the, the S cranks. Uh, got one. So got one in he said, there. "What do you, what about the S cranks and the hunt thought on those?" Uh, well, I've given John. Hey guys, I'm still here. <laughs> uh, we don't like the the Phil you hunt. Dig it out? Yeah. We don't really like the field hunts uh, very much. Uh, the S crank's a good crankbait. They're just expensive compared to the other plastic ones that you can buy. Uh oh. Mark, while you're doing that, Mark Moody says, "Are there certain conditions that cause you to fish the square bill over the spinner bait, or vice versa?" Um, kind of just said a little of that with the heat and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, well, I, it helps if your partner's throwing a spinner. Yeah, bait, I was gonna say my it? partner. Uh, you can't pry a spinner bait out of his hand, so um, so that makes it easy for me. To, you know, throw a square bill. Now I will tell you that um, I, you know, throwing a square bill out of the back of the boat is a trick because you don't want to get hung up. Yeah, you back. get hung up. You know, you do get hung up some, and you can bowstring it off or whatever. You know, but. So what I usually try to do is say, I'm hung, you know, so he doesn't have to keep going down the bank, so maybe I can get it loose before he has to turn around and go get it. Um, but, yeah, I would usually rather throw the square bill in the front, you know, in the front of the boat where I can. The other thing is, is if you're in the front, uh, you and Mark knows this, but you can get an angle on the things, just like I told you about fishing the laydowns with the grain. Well, if you're in the back of the boat, you don't get that choice because the boat may swing around or whatever. Uh, but in the front of the boat, you can angle it so you can get that uh, – you can get that square bill. So Daryl says most days the fish will tell us. <laughs> he said they'll tell us if they'll hit a spinner bait or a square yeah. bill. They'll tell us. Yeah. So so what it, do we got here? Es well, these? That, no, that's just back to that cloudy day deal. I've oh, okay. So that 
Yeah, here's an S crank. That's an S crank. Yeah, it's a nice bait. It's mm -hmm. a nice bait. I, uh, Austin, Austin gives me all my test baits, so, um, so this one's still in the box, which means I didn't give it back to him, um, which means it, it's probably a pretty solid bait. And then here's one that we're talking about ghost patterns and yeah, stuff like a, that for cloudy yeah, days. It's hard to find this on a, you know, this is an E an E two, but it's a ghost color, and. Uh, I so wanted you guys to get a little picture of that. Joe Reynolds says, uh, when fishing with a 2.5 and 4.0 into cover, uh, his hooks seem to cat his back hook seems to catch uh, catch. Does he is does he need to speed up his retrieve or anything like that, or is it just part of, you know, maybe changing his hook sizes, something like that? Well, you can go with shorter shank, but I would I always try to get the longest shank on the back just because it's worth it to get that fish. What I would tell you is that. Uh, don't usually when you're going through cover not always depends on you know every limb is different every lay down is different every stump is different you could have fork in it and you know you're coming up to that fork and you get, but for the most part you don't want to slow down when you get to the cover okay you, you don't want to slow down if you slow down and if you think about it the bait drops when you hit it with your bill it's going to tend to come over like that and the back hook does not come into effect if you slow it down and that belly and you slow it down and then a little bit and you drops then that tail can drop and catch something uh most of the time you want to make sure as you hit it you as you feel it coming up the limb you can kind of slow down till you feel it and then as you get there you want to kind of just give it a couple cranks and pop it over uh, that may give you some help there i don't know um, glenn says he'll give you 10 bucks for the e2 <laughs> yeah for an e2 yeah and then kevin southern wants to know if you've used any of the six cents l7 movement type baits have you no, mm -mm. Nope. I do. I have, I have a one of the great, huge crankbaits. Oh, the big. Yeah, the six. great big ones, and uh, and I've caught a couple of fish on it. But it's the great. I don't it's know. like equivalent to that big KVD one. Yeah, it's the, like a big KVD, but it's a big six cents. My uh, brother-in-law got me one for, for my birthday, and I tried it, and I really, I really like it. Uh, I wish to say I could get enough fish in the boat that I could just go for a huge fish sometimes, but you know, you don't pull that thing out unless you really, you know, wanting a big fish and. Usually I'm trying to catch five, so uh, you throw that thing on you. I know a lot of people like those six cents crankbaits, though. A lot of people are I've throwing those right I now. Haven't, I haven't bought any, yeah. so if they're, I think a lot of those plastic ones are made pretty much in the same mold as the KBDs and mm -hmm. uh, you know the Strike King molds are not a lot of different. The, the Academy ones are pretty solid. I've got some of those. I like them too, but but uh, but the. The KVDs are really good right out of the package, I can yeah. tell you that. Yeah, change the hooks out, and for the price, it's hard to beat. Plus, you can get them here at Buds. So, do you have any other questions? We're starting to wrap up here, it looks like. You're gonna You're gonna no, I did, it's been an hour, so okay. we're not going to do that. Has it been an hour? Yeah. I took up too long. long. That's all right. We've got good good info here. Yeah, so great info. If you want to... Something if you got if you got a quick about. question before we're starting to wrap up here, go ahead and name it, and I'll and I'll throw it throw it at John here. Otherwise, Austin, you well, want to start. Well, just remember, closing. if you have a question after this, just go ahead and type it yeah, down, we'll, and we can respond on Facebook or anything like that. Uh, not sure what we're going to talk about next week, but we will be back at seven thirty uh, next Monday night. Um, when this is over here in about thirty seconds, exit out of Facebook, pull up YouTube. That's good fish. Just go subscribe to our channel. Like I said, we're, we're pretty close to where we need to be number-wise. Um, there was some talk about maybe a big giveaway if we get to that number, but I don't know. thousand, who knows? Yeah, who you know, knows? We're getting close. So. Um, and when you're done with YouTube, right before you brush your teeth, hit Instagram, follow us. We'll follow you back. Um, and like I said, everything we do on Facebook goes to YouTube, goes to Instagram. So uh, we've got to get our subscriptions up on, uh, on YouTube. John, you got anything else to say? Nope. Thank you. I'd like to thank, you know, I've got, I've got some great people. If you guys want to go talk fishing or talk boats or whatever, Albert's Marine up in Armas, they're great people. They treat you like family. I know Austin and Peyton go up there and they're good people. The guys, their buds are doing great things and, you know, they got a great store here. So you should stop by. We got some unique stuff too, uh, which is kind of unique. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you can come out and look at some stuff. And, and a lot of times if you need something, they'll try to find it out and get it for you. So, uh, we got some good people around. Uh, I always try to uh, use the local people if you get because it, if you can get them because it's really nice to be able to have that close to home. We got a couple quick questions. Uh, uh, he's Frankie Rios is wanting to know: uh, Do you like graphite or glass rods? I don't. I, I, you haven't really thrown glass rods, right? I had a glass rod. I again, 
I think there's pros and cons no matter which way you go with the rod. Stiffer, less stiff. I, I, KBD uses the, the the big glass rod, his yeah. special glass rod. But I would tell you the difference if you watch KBD down at Grand, he's chucking a 40 foot cast. He's fishing, he was fishing, you know, slab rock, ledge rock a lot. You know, he was talking about transition zones, okay? He's not fishing specific targets. He's throwing it and making long casts. Well, that long glass rod makes a big difference on that. I would, I would give you that. That's not the type of fishing that, uh, that we're typically doing with the square bill. Um, but if you're doing that kind of fishing, yeah, the glass rod would be, would be uh, much more important. And Joe Reynolds, he's wanting to know line size. I think Joe, mainly in the the water where he's talking about fishing in this dirtier water, uh, you know, three to five foot, sometimes even shallower than that. He's usually throwing 20 pound mono. Um, anything less than that is a risk for a disaster, isn't it? Right. You know, it, if I really feel like the bait needs to go down another foot and maybe even around the docks or something where you need that depth a little more, I'll go down to 15. Now, around docks, it's not as critical because if they're coming out from under the floats, you're not going to get hung up as much as you are fishing stumps and timber. And then there's a period post-spawn, uh, even up at Truman, where they get on, on rock more. And sometimes as the sun gets up during the day, that, that two to three foot square bull just won't quite get it or won't get you as many bites. And then you need to go to maybe 15, I have to say go down to 15 so you can get that down a little deeper. Um, and so... Uh, I'll use some 15 then, and, and you could probably do it for the guys that like fluorocarbon. You might get by with fluorocarbon. Obviously, we go even a little deeper than that, maybe six inches we're talking, but six inches can make a difference if the fish don't want to come up in the water column very far. So, All right. Well, we appreciate you tuning in. We'll see you next, uh, next Monday night at 730. Go get on YouTube right now. That's a good fish. That's a good fish.